Hi, I'm Tom from Grand, and I'm here to share a few of our humble experiences while we're doing field testing. Okay. I know you guys are pretty much like really familiar with unit testing and why should we do it, but I want to say something about it because strictly jumping into a code makes me feel like uh, stupid. So uh, why do we do unit tests? Is it really slowing us down? I think it depends on the team size and the mutual trust between team members. Uh, so for example, I used to be working in this game that everybody is like a really mature engineering. Uh, and everybody mutually trusts each other. They trust the guy's implementation so that they, they feel that, oh, it's really slowing us down when we're trying to you know, uh, do this initial implementation, do this MVP, try to impress people so they can they can put money in, in our project. In that case, the unit test is not needed for the MVP product. But in the long run, you still need unit test. Otherwise, your code will be simply rotting. Like people can't read it, people can't maintain it. Um, the other thing is that tests is really documentation for your project. So if I write a big library, I convince people to use. I will always tell them, hey, look at my test cases. So these are the examples you, you can how to use, use my library. Right, so um, <laughs> the second thing is that does test coverage mean anything? Uh, the general answer is that, my opinion, my personal opinion, it should be always you know, above 60%. But doesn't, doesn't, is it meaningful to reach 100% test coverage? Case by case. But if you're trying to reach a higher coverage by writing flaky tests, that's a big no. So that's one of our uh, experience that we have this CI server that you know failed basically one of the two summits. Sometimes it's because uh, the test is just wrong. Sometimes it's because it's flaky. It's using external resources. It depends on the database. It reads Redis, but this value might be you know available at test time, so that your, your test is flaky. You're depending on something. It depends on something might not be available, right? So, uh, but unit testing is not a super good. It shows that we love the code, but it shows nothing more. So, you, except unit testing, you need UAT, you need integration test, you need stress test, you need small test. All these are needed for a, for a project to succeed, for a product to go to production. Okay, so uh, the key to not write flaky like test to me in our experience is that you, you should try to mock. We need to mock. So uh, what are things we need to mock? HTTP calls, MySQL, Redis calls, or whatever database or cache layer you're using. Uh, also, people tend to provide SDK to you. Then this SDK wraps their implementation. Then uh, you're not really testing the other people's code. You're trying to test your code. So mock them. Uh, you know, uh, in Golang specifically, if you're testing against a package, we shouldn't be testing anything outside this package. So anything with a package name dot something, this indicates that it's a, a external package, right? We shouldn't be testing other people's implementation, but anything within the package should be tested. I think that's a rule of thumb. Uh, then you know. Uh, uh, we can write code in many ways. Whether we can mock easily sometimes shows that you know we can change our Im implementation easily. So we are, let's say, I'm trying to read database. I'm trying to write SQL, raw SQL like directly, and calling you know Go SQL uh, implementation to read data from MySQL or write to that. It shows that if I want to change my mind, I don't want to use a MySQL anymore. I want to go for no SQL. I can't do that easily because my code is flooded with all these, with all these, you know, raw implementations without proper wrapping. So without proper wrapping, you can't, you can't mock, and you can't change your mind. You can't change your implementation. So other things, if you can mock easily, your logic is likely to be loosely coupled. So uh, example. A very simple test, a very naive simple test. So uh, let me explain the implementation, which is on the left side. Um, get from DB something, so it's a key, and we're supposed to return a string, or if there's error happen, we can error. 
So uh, suppose there's another third-party package called DB, and in that package there's a get method. Uh, what, we do, what we're really doing is that try to use that function, and if that function returns an error, then we return an error. If not, we simply append a underscore OK to the value retrieved. So a naive way to test it, of course, is you, you know just you know call the function and assume that this this uh, test as key, then result will be test as well, and so that the result should be test underscore OK when we test it. But this is apparently like uh, very depending on your DB. What if for the key test the value is not test, then you're fucked. So uh, by the way, uh, on the left side is also a, a test. It's also the test, but it's not an implementa implementation. The implementation stays the same. So uh, the shorter one, uh, test from DB. We are really trying to mock away the DB get function here. Like uh, before, we can mock it. We have to make sure we restore it because after this test case, we may be running some other test code. Then uh, you si you simply can't replace the function pointer without storing it, restoring it, which will break your other test cases. Then uh, this is a b very bad example for concurrent test because you are mocking the function pointer. Other tests might be mocking the function pointer, and if two coroutine are testing together, then you basically fuck again. But you generally get the idea. Uh, use a default call to mock the, uh, to restart function pointer back and then mock your function pointer, then uh, do the test, right? Uh, this is better than the previous one because it doesn't depend on what key is stored in the DB. I can always make sure if I'm the only tester doing this test here, it, it will always pass. So uh, apparently that's just a happy path. So what if we want to try some, you know, corner cases, and when the, when the function actually returns an error, so you have TTT, you have table-driven test. Uh, you basically list your test cases and test them in a loop, right? So there's nothing fancy. And even better way, um, you know, uh, DB dot get is a subpacky is a sub package, and the get function is really a global function. The many tests may be accessing at the same time. So if we mock it, replace the function pointer at runtime, it might break other tests. So how to make sure we are not doing something so you know this so you know uh, uh, in the wrong way. So uh, we have a local wrapper called dbget, which is you know starting with a smaller piece. That means it's within the package. If it's within the package, I can mock it. I can mock it, and I, I'm sure that if and it tests running on another package, it's not going to see this function pointer. That's why they have no chance to mock them. That's why uh, changing this function pointer doesn't you know, really destroy anything on the other packages. And usually, if you don't run go test with concurrency level, then in your own package, all the tests are supposed to be running you know, one by one. So it should be good. It should be good. Um, then, uh, of course, on the left side is the implementation, it's the updated implementation. On the right side is the TDT. Now, this time, we, we're still doing the same thing. We defer, we, have, we make a defer call to replace the function pointer back. And, of course, you can come out some test libraries that do this. You don't have to write this ugly code at every time. Maybe it's just a one-line call. Uh, then, with the TDT, we're actually mocking the private function in our own package. It's a bit better. It gets rid of a, of a lot of problems, but uh, it's not the best way because what if you have like multiple places assessing you know some public package or uh, external resources? Then you basically have to create a local wrapper for each and single one of them. Then your code looks like oh shit, holy shit, what, what, what sort of code is that? Also, you have to make multiple different calls, right? Uh, in one of in any of your test cases, so that's not something we want. So the ultimate way uh, is ultimate to our experience. Uh, I stand to be corrected. There must be a better way to do a lot of things, but this is right now uh, the state of our uh, grant. Uh, we are basically trying to set up a context, right? So for each. 
function that does that does uh, you know something need to be tested. Uh, the context will always be the first parameter, first input parameter to this function. So what is within the context? You usually will have a setup. You can run this in your package init. You can do some pre-setup code. You can even do some you know setup in your test. So that's not the thing I'm trying to cover here today. But basically, you have a way to initialize the context. Let's say I have a DB helper with you know a lot of DB function calls. I'm going to set up a context, and the context really is just a hash map. So within the hash map, I have a, I have a DB helper struct. So this struct is very special because its member is a function pointer. This member is a function pointer means that you can you know um, you can replace it, but you can also get your own very specific copy of this DB helper. And it's in the context, it's in the hash map. So when you test, the next logical thing to do is that you set up a fake context. So in the fake context, you can have a fake DB helper. So for the fake DB helper, you can always the real DB helper who test. But you, you, you're supposed to replace the DB helper, get DB member, which is a function pointer. Let's replace that. And then you can basically do whatever you want. You don't have to defer because this is your own very private object when you're testing the function. So if you see it here, we're making a context here. So this context is just within this, uh, within this, uh, uh, this test function. No other test function or whatever you know, production code is going to see this variable. That's why it's safe to replace it. That's why it's thread safe. So I feel that's the ultimate way. Uh, for example, you know, Web Taxi is basically doing. Please. Uh, yes, I wonder what else I can install in Web Taxi apart from the. Let me give an example. Um, so why context is uh, is helpful in uh, in business logic development? So uh, for example, Grab is basically a, you know red hailing app, right? We have a booking service as the service sitting internally processing passengers' requests and try to find a matching driver, then make it happen, make the red happen, and you know pick it up, drop off, and leave. There are so many things happening in the whole lifetime of a booking. So all these things can be stored in the booking context, right? And also the helper functions. Suppose this booking, you know, I need to flush to DB. So I need to flush to my hot storage. When the data become cold, I need to flush that to the cold storage. I need to read from these, these storages. I need to you know, send out a message to driver, I need to send out a message to passenger, all these are helper functions, so they might not be available at your test time. Right? When you're running a code on CI, when you make a submission, um, the key here is to mock them. So in the booking context, there will always be a helper, so helper has many external functions that can be mocked at, at, at view when, you, when you, you know, you're trying to set up, set up a test. Also, we are storing whatever we are storing in the memory, putting this into the hash map. So I hope that answer your, answer your question. We are, we are actually dumping other things in the context. So the good thing about this is the good thing about this is that we are really free to replace them at any time. So that's why it's trend safe. It's supposed to be good. Please, Michael. Uh, yeah, I should know. Uh, how do you compare this one, this this way of the writing the function with the um, uh, dependency injection? Right. For example, this, this one you have you set up the context object, right? Uh, how about you uh, rely on the another package like for example DB, right? But instead of uh, passing the string of and context on the function get from DB, uh, you passing the interface of the of, of, of the uh, package by like unify in the in the first the package we have a get db uh, method right so you yep. pass in here then later you can mark it that's a very good thought so uh, we went down that path one time yeah. uh, let's say this uh, this db package we have an interface that define all the methods we need right it starts the next logical step is that we can have a mock implementation of the db right but what if the db has like twenty methods. You only need, you look, you only you only care about one of them in your test. You always have to mock all of them 
to call yourself an implementation of that interface? No, I don't think so. For example, uh, for here we need the getDB uh, method, right? So in the test file, I will create a new, uh, for example, new truck. Yeah. And the truck have a getDB method. So yeah. I define. So here in the implementation, uh, instead of uh, depend on the DB object, I have a like get DB adapter, for example, get DB yeah. helper, for example. So uh, on the test, I create a new object which also have get DB. Yep. So, so I only have defined the interface for that method only. Uh, I think I get what you mean. So with some manipulation or uh, uh, a techniques, you can get away with implementing all the other things, only implementing that. Yeah. But it's it's small code to me, right? What if you can simply replace one function pointer? So compare. Uh, there were some design decisions here. Uh, I didn't want to go into that, but uh, let me just briefly say uh, what I think. Golang interface is not cost-free. You're passing an interface around, you cast that interface back to your struct, it actually, uh, multiple things are happening. It's not like a, f it's not like in C++, it's, you know, uh, what would you call it, dynamic cost? It's not like that. So in Go on the interface type actually stores one type and one pointer to the actual data. So casting that to your struct is not free. If you have if you have this DB helper, you know it's just a pointer. Passing it around is 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 quite free. It's like passing an integer around, and replacing the pointer in the object is also, you know, sort of low cost to me. That's why, uh, for the simplicity, for the low cost thing, I choose this way to inject the dependency. But, you know, as a third party package provider, I tend to, you know, provide this sort of mock at package level so that you don't have to wrap everything in the DB helper and put in your context. You can simply, like, if, if I'm the writer of this DB package, right? I'm gonna come up with this this new DB helper sort of sort of helper method. So this help method will return this helper with a list of you know uh, function pointer definition, each pointing to this to their default implementation. But you are free to you know change one or two or three of them at any time. Okay. Feels like it's more flexible. All right, so. Um, I think the interesting discussion over there, but here I think you're sacrificing some type safety. Mm -hmm. It feels like it. Exactly. So or I was hoping see. nobody was pointing that out. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, you basically lose your protection over this at runtime. So if you don't agree on this, like we have a big group of programmers who yeah. doesn't understand this principle and they come here, oh, hey, hey, hey. I can change this in my free view, right? Yeah, can, point yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this one definitely needs some, you know, you know the communication, and discipline, and you know, uh, agreement sort of thing. But uh, and my point is that this is the way we find is very efficient doing, you know, concurrent testing. Yeah. So as long as other people in the team they get this concept, right? So. Uh, since this uh, opportunity, I'm gonna I'm uh, gonna put yeah. the slides here. We are still, you know, uh, extensively hiring. We, we are so short hand of people, and we are so, you know, enthusiastic in Go. Please, if you're, you know, if you're a Go on programmer, you want to you want to help us to build our pipeline to make our stack better, or you know, you're interested to do something meaningful for the. You know, 0.6 billion people in Southeast Asia to make their you know life easier by providing a better way of transportation. Please join us. So yeah. Thank you. Uh, you have questions. I I might not have answers. <laughs> <laughs> any any more questions? Yeah. How long will your test run? Sorry. So my host there? Yeah, how long does do you, do you run all the okay. all the uh, that's a that's a question very tough to answer. We have so many tests in the system. 
So one of the tests is UAT, it's user acceptance yes. test. It's very relevant to our service. And then we have to simulate other scenarios, possible scenarios generated by user. Like what if the user make a booking and there's no driver around? What if a user makes a booking and driver so makes one booking and cancel? You commit your change to your repository, you run the We go through all, all of this. We go through all of this. So it can take like you know from minutes to you know thirty minutes. Mm. Um, depends. So we have a smart detector because uh, in Grab, all the Go programmer is sharing one and only one repository for the sake of everybody owns the code. Everybody can jump in and see what other people is doing. And uh, you literally can you know, submit div to any branch, to any of the service. So you only need the Arjun also or the team to, to, to be the code reviewer, right? So to do this, we actually implement some kind of smart detector with the lines of change you just made, how many projects are actually affected. Then we are going to test against all these and make sure you're not breaking anything. So once those are satisfied, satisfied, you, you know, uh, teams are really trying to bring on UATs. Please, hey James. Uh, what, a, a bit of a shift. What is your in the testing frameworks? Not in go the testing infrastructure, the CD pipelines you, uh, that you are using. Okay. For example, Jenkins, Go CD as by ThoughtWorks. Okay. Or uh, Concourse by Pivotal. So the short answer is Jenkins. Uh, the long answer is that we have been traveling from Travis to you know uh, John Doyle, from John Doyle to GoCD, from GoCD to Jenkins. So each of them we learn a big lesson. <laughs> Either it's too complex, too slow, or too costly, then we set up our own Jenkins on our own you know uh, Amazon Cloud. So our Jenkins right now is the state of art. Is it has this master slave structure that it can, you know, spawn more slaves on on demand, and uh, it is pretty smart. We are pretty satisfied with, it, but still trying to you know improve it. But I you know te testing framework level, we're not using any. Using sorry, we are not using any. Okay, yeah, we're using uh, testify yes, but that's just for it's super convenient a search. Statement. So we can assert this and assert that in our test cases. We don't have to write oh, if this, then uh, stop testing instead of some of the rubbish code. Um, but uh, you know, for user acceptance test, we actually try to you know come out come out our own you know test runner framework, like simulate other scenarios and generate other outputs and compare them. Are they are they the same way sub it will be? So yeah. Are your tests written in R spec style or J unit style? Or okay, well, looks like J unit style. Oh, that, yeah, J unit table. Okay, it looks like J unit style. I didn't know, so you say <laughs> it looks like J unit. I think yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the gold tip of J unit style. Okay. Yeah. What? With, it, it looked like your tests were also table tests. So you you pump your uh, your your test vector through and check all of them in one go. Yep. Okay. Yep. So table test is a must, at least. Uh, instead of uh, doing the mock in the test for the DB collection, uh, is there any reason why uh, you don't uh, have the developer uh, install the DB into the local environment? No, well, we do that. We do that. So uh, this is the context of the unit testing. So. Uh, Golang unit testing is package level. So in the package, I'm really trying to test my implementation against, uh, you know, if, DB, if the DB method is retending me something or not retending me something, so all the statements and I try to cover them. But in reality, you know, uh, in the DB package, of course, uh, I'm not gonna set up a MySQL mock and try to, you know, intercept SQL uh, doing all the funny things. I, I will go straight do integration tests. I'll be, I'll be writing, like, uh, I'm trying to store this data in MySQL, then I'm going to read it, are they the same, right? I'm going to update it, I'm going to load it again, are they the same, sort of thing. So I do a lot of integration tests in the DB package, then for the user of the DB package, they can be pretty confident that this thing either works or, you know, uh, will throw me a proper error. 
so that uh, I only need to handle my IP path and the, path, the part that uh, handles the error. Yeah, but for your UAT and integration test, you point to a real database, right? Of course. So for the UAT, why it's so slow, it takes like 20 seconds. It's because we are reading and writing real data yeah, from... Yeah. 20 seconds is so fast <laughs> compared to other languages. Well, uh, and some and other things. You know, 20 seconds is the test time. If you do this uh, not in a proper way, the building itself could take half a minute. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, like for example, you have a, a, a method we use use the DB package, and the DB package, you know, the ORM, ORM, like they have a like on have a method like from where select where where and where in yep. and where all they to build a query yep. to MySQL. So basically, the method itself is only contain the code to another method, like for the DB helpers. Yep. Yeah. So how do you test that one? Because what what we say that we agree that we um, we, we we don't uh, actually run the another method. We want the, the the external. But all the everything, all the live code in the method is only calling another method. Yep. So how do you test? to make sure that the final query is correct. If I understand your question correctly, um, it involves some code level separation. So you have business logics that needs to assess data, that needs to read or write to the data, right? So these things, I usually write them in the package itself, like it's DB Assizer or whatever, uh, it, it, it take care of the database and the cache layer right at the same time all, all differently but anyway it's wrapped in a package so in that package in that package you can actually do some integration test because it's supposed to do that otherwise you're just confusing yourself hey from this from <laughs> appendix to the uh, what is it really doing mocking doesn't make any sense there but to the upper level to the to the you know uh, if we layer the code in this way, then to the top of the code is the logic implementation part, then it should be pretty transparent. Also, I can change my mind at any time, right? So this DB assessor I'm reading from this cache and this MySQL, right? Mm -hmm. I can change to Elasticsearch at any time. Um, so it's, part, part of this is very important that your arrows and dependencies are one way. Your own, this one doesn't depend backwards, therefore as long as you know that you've tested in the one every level coming up, yeah. then you don't have to worry about... No, for example, if I use a third party service, like for example, I, I want to use a packet from a GitHub repo, I need to import it in our, our project. Mm -hmm. And the thing is like, like for example, the Go or M, mm -hmm. I, I, I use, I, I, I have one method to get data from database, I use Go or M to build a query. Mm -hmm. And like, at the end, I have the like DD dot, get to return the data, actually run the query and return the data. But the thing is, in my home function, is only the code to another library, to the third party library only. Mm -hmm. So basically, because we don't get the third party library, so how do you write in depth for that method? That's the, in, th that, that would be in your integration test. Yep, so, so we don't so write in So what you, you, what you do is you write the unit tests for things, assuming that it returns correctly for everything else. What you've done is you stuck, uh, what you've done is you built your interface around the external uh, the party. So if you test everything around that and then you test all your stuff through the uh, integration test, then you have a, a good coverage and you covered your paths coming in and your paths going out. Okay, so, so yes, uh, I don't think integration test is meant to be replaced by unit testing. You definitely need integration test. The thing is that if you, uh, in my point of view, if we can, let's try to contain the integration test to a certain specific package or a few of them, so that uh, the logic to the logic is pretty clean. I don't need to do integration tests in my you know business logic package. I can rely on those special packages. I can run them on CI. If there's change, if not, I just assume the hey, integration test has been done, so this part has, hasn't been changed. Let's just verify the UI, uh, the unit testing, which will be super quick, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, any more questions?
All right, thank you guys. All right, please. Uh, again, please, please uh, if you're interested in grab, please let's have a chat. <laughs> grab a beer, you know. With the beer, we can say anything. <laughs> Right, thank you, Chance. Uh, if you would uh, like to join Grab, you can go to Tahi or me. Because it's my way out of Grab.